Hello and uh, welcome everybody to this new cultural mobility webinar that we are co-organizing today. Uh, we are very happy to welcome so many participants. Um, this webinar is dedicated to UK EU mobility flows with a particular focus on the visual arts. My name is Johan Flock. I'm the Director of Operations at On The Move. And for our uh, visually impaired participants, I'm a white man in my mid forties with a short uh, brown graying hair and facial hair. I'm wearing a blue skirt today, blue shirt, not skirt. <laughs> um, uh, you must know that On The Move is uh, the international uh, information network dedicated to artistic and cultural mobility. We gather 67 members from 26 countries and we are celebrating our 20 years anniversary of this year. On The Move is quite well known for providing a lot of uh, free information up to date very regularly on mobility opportunities, on mobility funding, and On The Move advocates for the value of cross-border cultural mobility. As part of our uh, co-funded uh, program, co-funded by the European Union, we propose regularly web webinars, webinars that are streamed thanks to our member and partner all around TV, who shares um, resources and knowledge that are particularly relevant to the culture field. Today for this webinar, uh, we, um, uh, we worked very closely with the uh, Arts Info Point UK, and I'm very happy to give the floor to Katie James. Katie. Thank you, Johan. Good afternoon, everyone. Prouda. It's really nice to be here and it's good to see so many. I recognize a lot of names there on the screen and some new names there as well that I don't um, that I that I don't recognize. But it's just great to have you all in the room today. My name is Katie from Arts Info Point UK, which is the UK's mobility information point. Um, I am a white female um, in her 40s, short brown hair, glasses on today. Uh, I've got a blue jumper on. Um, I go by the pronouns she and her. Um, so a bit about Arts Info Point UK. It's an initiative based on a partnership of the four arts councils across the UK, Wales Arts International, Arts Council Northern Ireland and Creative Scotland and Arts Council England. And I think my colleague from Arts Council England is here today, Nicola Smith. Um, so I'm based at Wales Arts International, which is the international development agency of the Arts Council of Wales. So as at Arts Arts Info Point UK, we develop free and practical resources to support and welcome international artists to the UK by providing clear and accurate information. We do this through events, webinars with partners and experts on artist mobility, like this event with in partnership with On The Move today, as well as resources like our visa guide for artists visiting the UK for work and by signposting to government resources and other resources through trusted partners and networks that are doing good work around artist mobility as well. It's all on our website and I'll put some links in the chat afterwards. We're developing this work to support the value of international cultural exchange and collaboration and artists who are leading on that to ensure that it continues. Our main focus is to support artists coming to the UK, but we do recognize there is a current need for information since the UK left the EU, which was some time ago, but um, <laughs> but the, the impact is still ongoing. So we have some developed some resource um, for artists working in the EU as well. So for, for outgoing mobility as well. Um, and we also signpost and across colleagues and networks and contacts that we have across Europe, including the network of the On The Move Mobility Information Point, of which we're also members of. Um, I know everybody in this room today will have some experience and perspective of uh, some of the challenges and impact of the UK's exit um, from the EU. We no longer have freedom of movement or access to the single market and um, sector is needing to adapt in a number of ways and learn new ways of doing things. And I know that this can feel quite daunting for some artists who are trying to work across borders. And that's something that we're really keen to support, um, support artists in, in, in finding that information. And so in the face of these challenges and more global challenges, including COVID and climate crisis and increasing costs, it just feels really important um, today that we can have this discussion at an international level um, to look at the impacts of this across the visual arts sector. So I'm really delighted to be able to partner with, it, with On The Move on this today to discuss that. And I'm really looking forward to hearing from a really fantastic panel of, um, of experts 
and as well as hearing from experience across the room, actually. So um, thank you very much, everyone. And back to you, Ohan. Well, thank you, Katie, for these, uh, these kind words. Um, just to give you um, an overview of, um, of why we are organizing this webinar. I guess these past days, uh, the latest uh, political developments in the UK put back the Brexit conversation in focus, also to try to uh, echo some of the findings of uh, the difficulties that many economic sectors have had uh, these past months and years to navigate these new circumstances. Across 2021, uh, many conversations took place in the performing arts, also in the music industry and many other creative industry to raise awareness of these new circumstances and address uh, new needs in terms of transnational EU-UK cultural collaboration. Um, I guess both On The Move and Arts Info Point UK are led or contributed to many events to provide support and guidance. And um, as Katie said, the Mobility Info Points have been increasing their effort to better help UK or EU based as arts professionals when dealing with post Brexit issues from visas to custom rules. Today, we wanted to focus on the visual arts ecosystem because we see its specificities with a lot of freelance artists, freelance curators, arts in residency programs that are not always equipped to navigate heavy administrative processes, but also because in this particular ecosystem, we see a real drive to maintain fruitful cultural relations. We asked uh, our dear colleague, Veronica Cover to come and facilitate this conversation together uh, uh, with us and to lead and ask as many questions as possible to our, to our uh, distinguished panelist. Uh, Veronica has worked for many Creative Europe projects and most recently she worked for Pearl, the live performance Europe uh, organization and Opera Vision. Um, um, Veronica, I guess it's time for me to give you the floor and I'm sure you can introduce our panelist. Thank you. Thank you very much, Yuan. Thank you as well, Katie, for your introductions, which will cut mine short as uh, I aim to open the floor as quickly as possible to questions. So as Yuan said, my name is Veronica Coover. Uh, for the visually impaired, I'm a dark haired white woman in my thirties wearing a yellow dress and bright lipstick. I have the pleasure of facilitating today's webinar on the mobility flows between EU member states and the UK in the visual arts. So for those of you who have been asleep in the past couple of years, just a very brief sociopolitical backdrop. In early 2020, the COVID-19 pandemic put a halt to cross-border collaboration in general and to that between the British Isles and the European mainland, which we are interested in here in particular. And at the same time, of course, uh, Brexit redrew the European map with the United Kingdom withdrawing from the European Union on 31st of January 2020. And now we are interested in seeing that as the borders gradually reopened and travel restrictions and health related measures were lifted, arts professionals and organizations quickly learned to navigate the new set of rules for traveling, working abroad, shipping and presenting their work. And to come to terms with the fact that while before there was free movement of people and cultural goods, now visas, work permits, the famous ATA carnet, the customs requirements became the new norm. The cultural sector has proved itself to be very creative and resilient in meeting these challenges and advocating for its actors' needs. But as mentioned before, the conversation has been largely dominated by the performing arts field, and it is time to highlight the specificities of the visual arts ecosystem, which beyond its globally connected big players is um, characterized by individual freelance artists and curators who are relatively isolated and not always well equipped to navigate cumbersome administrative processes. So we're here to investigate these 
double consequences of COVID-19 and Brexit on mobility flows by focusing on the testimonies of our four panelists. How has all of this affected their respective artistic and curatorial practice? What I hope to do here is zoom out of the nor Northern European dominated uh, narrative and delve into a variety of issues from access to residencies and circulation of artworks and hopefully jointly identify gaps to be filled to pursue meaningful cultural relations between the UK and the EU. So without further ado, um, let me present our experts. We have with us Alessio Antonioli, who is the director of Gasworks in London, where he leads a program of exhibitions, international residencies and participatory events. He is simultaneously also the director of Triangle Network, which is a worldwide network of visual art organizations which work together to create artists exchange and build knowledge. And on top, as if this was not enough, in 2022, he was appointed curator at Fondazione Memo in Italy. We are also joined by Theodore Eraira Guerre. I hope I pronounced that correctly, otherwise slap me on my wrist. Um, he's a multidisciplinary artist who switches practices between print, painting and sculpture, and who himself lives and works between London and Lisbon. His work is held largely um, widely in different collections from MoMA to the British Museum, Museo, Museo Kalush Bulbenkian, Centre Pompidou, the Tate Special Collections, etc. etc. We have with us Maria Luigia Joffre, who's also a visual artist as well as a performer. She develops an interdisciplinary practice informed by Mediterranean anthropology, loss and desire. And she has founded and currently co-directs In Ruins, which is a nonprofit association dedicated to contemporary art research in relation to archaeology. Last but not least, let me introduce you to Paolo Mele, who is a cultural manager and the founder and director of the contemporary art organization Random, as well as the director of Cora Contemporary Arts Center and the president of STARE, the Italian Association of Artists in Residencies. Thank you all four of you for being with us today. Um, let me kick off this webinar today by asking you, Alessio, from your vantage point, um, bridging two perspectives, working both in Italy and the UK, can you describe the difficulties in continuing to work with international artists? Are the obstacles that you encounter the same in Italy and the UK? And please also briefly introduce yourself. Hi, um, hi everybody. Thank you uh, um, for the introduction, Veronica. Um, I'm Alessio Antonioli, as Veronica was saying, director of Gasworks and Triangle Network and also uh, curating uh, a program in, in Rome for the Fondazione Memmo. Uh, white male with graying hair in his early, early 50s, I guess, uh, for those that can't see a picture of me. Um, I still think it, it's difficult to kind of summarize the feelings that one has uh, uh, around the issue of Brexit. And one of profound disappointment, and many people out there would say, it's time people like me get over it. But as an Italian living in the UK and having lived in the UK for almost over 30 years, um, the impact that Brexit had and continues to have is both financial, political, but I think the first thing that hits you is what goes straight to your stomach, which is uh, a sort of like a sense of um, this act of separation being something that I think as a European uh, who has benefited from uh, the open borders, there's a, a sort of like a sense of disappointment and a sense of loss, uh, a sense of loss of a connection that I think, and maybe if there's a lesson, this is one, uh, one that we took for granted, because uh, we felt that things were going to progress in one direction, but we've learned, uh, we've learned the opposite. And I think 
uh, yes, I think we should talk about the the the, the complications that 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 Brexit has had uh, on on our activities, but a lot of them are emotional and they continue to be emotional. And I think they are for me as an organizer of activities, but also for many of the artists. And and I think also, and perhaps this, well, actually, it sounds maybe perhaps judgmental, but I guess as a small organization, Gasworks is a very small organization in, in, in London with very limited budgets. The reliance on uh, working with limited means and being able to amplify things by working together, whether it was working together with peers in the UK or within Europe, is what allowed a small organization uh, through its network, through its connections with artists to, to, um, to deliver on a much larger scale. And, and what the Brexit has done is really uh, kind of undermined that. Uh, so I think, and, and, and also I think that the fact that we've had, um, as you uh, clarified, Veronica, you know, mentioned at the beginning, the, the impact of Brexit in the middle of it has sort of like clouded a little bit the, 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 the sort of the clarity of what Brexit actually meant, because now it's all embroiled. Is it Brexit? Is it pandemic? Is it the financial crisis? Is this, is the energy bills problems and they've all kind of come together and it, and it's creating a very um very difficult difficult atmosphere for me based in the UK and I'm actually better placed to talk about that than than in Rome because I guess my connection with Rome is it's more about uh, delivering an exhibition and it's a public a private foundation so I think it's a very different relationship to working with artists because it does you know the the one in Rome is as comes from private funding and has private means, but as a as a publicly funded organization in the UK and therefore very much uh, uh, linked to the public spending in the UK, access to fundraising that comes from funding here and internationally, and when I say internationally, I talk about the UK. One of the last projects that we were able to, to deliver with uh, EU funding um, ended at the end of last year uh, and it was through a partnership with the Royal College here in the UK and many organizations in the in in Europe and that was really the end of it uh, in terms of how we can as I was saying earlier amplify the little work that we do work with artists in a, in a much wider way and also think more ethically because again when you're really small, you rely on people being overstretched, overworked, underpaid a lot of the times. But actually joining forces is what allows us to kind of put budgets together, to put resources together, to put efforts together, to put minds together in order to be able to deliver something bigger. And, uh, and, and we are very worried that we're not going to have those opportunities again. So I, I think... Maybe maybe that's a, a place to kind of leave it and open it to the rest. I don't know, Veronica, if you want me to say anything else, but one of the things that happened recently uh, that doesn't necessarily uh, refer to artists, but it's very much part of the arts ecology is that we have been uh, uh, trying to recruit a new member of staff for Gasworks. And of course, as an international organization that really has one foot in the UK, and the rest all over the world, not just Europe. We've had to, for example, for the first time think, oh, we have uh, applicants from the EU and we have no idea what it would mean to, um, to then get, you know, start talking about rights to remain, what visa uh, that needs to be in place. And, 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 a, and I think there's a, there's a sense of, do I even go down that way? Because it's probably going to be unaffordable to a small organization uh and also uh, unaffordable in, ter in terms of money but also unafford in unaffordable in terms of the time that it takes a small group of people to then manage a much bigger bureaucracy in order to continue um to continue to be so internationally it, it, to maintain a composition that is so international Saying that, and I'm talking about this doom and gloom, um, it's hard not to, 
but of course uh, we are also extremely determined to go against the grain to uh, to go against this sort of nationalist perspective that is sort of being enforced on us politically and financially so this is why i thought it was important to be part of this conversation and i and and i f hope that we can get more out of each other through i don't know find find wh whether they're loopholes or uh whether they are opportunities to work together because i think it's completely necessary and what was at one point uh a, a, a nice thing to do in terms of working internationally as a way of kind of making a richer uk or uh, en enriching each other through uh, dialogue is is gone beyond that it's become uh, radical it's become politically challenging uh, and therefore even more needed. So I'm hoping that um, the conversations take away the doom and gloom and try to sort of figure out a way in which uh, we can inject some energy and try and move forward in spite of what the politics um, enforces on us. Thank you, Alessio, for uh, this very rich first um intervention and indeed I can hear in your words um, it, you're very right to open up the conversation not just to artists and curators but the whole value chain so to speak uh, by talking about staffing and recruitment processes and um, an ecosystem that has always rightly prided itself uh, on being very diverse and international I can imagine is uh, deeply affected by the fact that all of a sudden it cannot as easily live up to those same standards, which brings me to a very different case study. Uh, Maria Luigia, you, your work at In Ruins is very much anchored in the Mediterranean, and uh, you consider it as, as a cultural uh, basin for cultural exchange, of course, not just um, factual, but also um, in in everything that it uh, that that it brings with it, um, in terms of our dreams, in terms of our uh, expectations, projections, etc. And it has been so for um, for the UK as well. Can you tell us a little bit about how in ruins the way that you run your um, research residency, if I'm not mistaken? has been affected um, by, by Brexit, by the fact that it is not as easy to, to host British artists. Do you have a case study that you could share with us? Okay, uh, hello everyone. And uh, yes, we started uh, in ruins actually uh, with the link with the UK because uh, um, I uh, founded uh, uh, the residency since uh, I moved back to Italy from London and uh, the main link, the main uh, network we had was uh, with the uh, obviously among universities and uh, we sent our open call through the channel of university. So at the beginning we had uh, quite a lot, um, quite, 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 quite a, a notable response, uh, I would say by uh, UK artists or, or whoever UK based artists. Uh, while, uh, as I was saying last time during our little meeting, like drafting meeting, and um, after Brexit, uh, this uh, percentage of uh, artists applying to um, the residency, I don't know if it, because of the Brexit, but um, in, the number of applicants is less than before in terms of uh, UK provenience. And uh, first of all, this is, I would say, it's it's a fact. It's a, um, it's a something that I can easily notice. And uh, another thing uh, is uh, obviously the COVID time made uh, um, some, created some issues with the uh, hosting artists from UK in Italy because some rules were different. One of uh, one among all was uh, uh, Amy Alray. I will text the name of the artist then, and um, she uh, did the residency with us just in the middle of the pandemic. And uh, for example, um, she had to wait five days of quarantine after entering the Italy. 
and uh, this uh, created some logistic problems in terms of like hosting an artist for five days uh, she's quarantining she has to stay alone we need to bring food to her just a few little things that anyway um, are a problem but uh, however I, I can also say that uh, um, differently from uh, making an exhibition that can create some problem of production for example transportation um, or um, delay in the sending stuff and all these kind of problems uh, the residency uh, the mobility so no this is the title of the our webinar i think the mobility of people um in, in terms of when doing a residency is not a lot affected in my experience uh, also this year for example we had an artist from us which so is not europe so the kind of problems uh, they face are similar but uh, uh, if you stay not for a long time, so you can also have a, like not not a working permit, so it's not very very affected. And I think, on a way, this can be a nice solution to create a, a cultural exchange, exchange rather than making exhibitions. So um, obviously, this is a uh, not a good point because. Uh, uh, exhibition have value and obviously this affect the market and the culture and the uh, intellectual exchange but on another way the residency is also a way to create a, a temporary community with UK artists or UK based artists or Italian artists in uh, UK without having uh, such a uh, um, I don't know how can I say su 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 such issues uh, we we were mentioning. Um, so yes, this is one thing I I've been reflecting on, and the one other is uh, uh, that uh, as a um, artist myself and also my fellow Nicola, uh, he lived in London as well. So uh, we have a lot of network there, but. Uh, on another way, universities and institutions are less responsive to create, the, I mean, at least in our um, uh, experience, uh, to create uh, um, collaboration or um, any kind of uh, formal um, way to, to, to create this uh, uh, temporary community. Although we just uh, uh, recently had a collaboration with UCL, so there are some um, some situation that I make this available. But on another way, for example, uh, uh, when I try to uh, um, connect with some uh, um, uh, department of my previous university, uh, before Brexit it was much more. Uh, um easy um quick also that the way they were responding the way um to fix uh, um a, a collaboration whatever while now it's more uh, slow more doubtful and this is my experience i don't know um on a way um to create uh, um, a cultural exchange in the Mediterranean with the UK, it can be also in terms of ID, in terms of uh, theoretical terms, uh, an interesting point because uh, although UK is not literally in the Mediterranean, but, but no, the Europe is Mediterranean for the most of, uh, of it. So it's uh, a tricky point that can lead to interesting discussions, I think. Thank you, Maria Luigia. And before I pass on um, some of your interesting points, I forgot to uh, ask you to describe yourself physically. So if you would do that, I love asking this question uh, to visual artists, by the way. My, uh, sorry, say again, to describe myself? If you could very briefly describe yourself physically to those uh, who might watch and are visually impaired. Ah, okay. Uh, myself, sorry, I didn't understand myself, how I look. Yes. Ah, okay, as a person. Yes, uh, I'm Maria Luigia, uh, I'm Italian, uh, I'm born in Italy, in southern Italy, and uh, I have uh, uh, brown hair, 
and glasses and um, sitting on a chair uh, in my living room <laughs> and uh, yeah and outside it's uh, cloudy <laughs> thank you thank you Paolo, while Maria Luigia was speaking, I also thought of, of you because I, I found it very interesting. It was as if she was already pointing towards possible workarounds. Um, she she seemed to be saying that access to residencies was not as deeply affected um, by Brexit in terms of mobility as, uh, for instance, organizing international exhibitions is. Have you had the same experience um, at Stare, or is there something that you could share with us in relation to this? Yes, it's my turn, I suppose, or just a brief uh, answer to this point. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, this is true. There is no, um, I mean, the, the, the impact of on residency is not so um, important like in uh, other fields, like, uh, for example, production costs or um, mobility of products and artworks and so on. Uh, but yeah. I mean, in general, yeah, this is this is a good point. Uh, uh, till now, we can still use some like expedient of uh, that the law uh, allow us to use. For example, using uh, uh, visa mobility, it don't don't go through the visa issue and avoid visa issue with, for example, uh, some um, touristic visa that doesn't require uh, a long um, process. Uh, so yeah, this is a, this is a good point. But the, anyway, before facing some of the important cultural impacts of Brexit, <laughs> And uh, into the half, uh, into the Hartford, I would like to start my um, consideration starting from what I could define a general sentiment. And here, the general sentiment is uh, that it's more and more complex to start and to imagine new projects in collaboration with UK organization and uh, involving the UK uh, artists. Um, because uh, I mean, it's, it's a very simple, uh, uh, let's say, question. As I, I was say, uh, we as cultural operator and the cultural manager, uh, we already do quite, let's say, tricky uh, job and uh, difficult job in order to uh, organize uh, exhibition and uh, to work in a field where there is no, uh, with limited resources, basically, economical resources. And uh, so if, the, the, if we have the opportunity to choose to avoid any uh, boring bureaucratic issues or, or like insane uh, matter about visa or custom duties, it's clear that generally, um, we choose the easy way. And uh, the easy way in this case is collaboration with other countries from Europe and not from, uh, from UK. Uh, but yeah, there is an answer to all this and the, the answer, some, I mean, I think that is always art. Um, so I, I, if you want, I mean, I. I I can continue with my reflection or do you want to stay just on this I'm very happy for you to to continue on your reflection. I think it is very important that you center this sentiment as well, because in the end, we're also here to talk about the future of mobility between uh, European Union countries and the UK. And will we see a gradual um, departure from one to the other. I think it is very interesting that uh, you say that residencies, which are still rooted in the values of international exchange and in person collaboration, continue to be a breeding ground for artists. You also talked about production costs. Uh, we will 
return to that. Let me first, very, very uh, down to earth, ask you to also describe yourself uh, physically and perhaps that very interesting um, image showing behind you. Yeah, thank you. I'm Paolo Mele. I'm the director of Cora Contemporary Art Center Random, uh, both an Italian organization based in the, uh, the south of Italy, uh, in the department of Lecce. And uh, I'm a 41 years old white Italian male, uh, born, uh, I mean, uh, in, in the south of Italy, but uh, I don't drink drink any wine and beer, so it's it's <laughs> it's um, not easy to to justify that I'm an Italian. So I, I looks like another like a man from another country. Uh, anyway, uh, yeah, on my background, what what you are seeing, I, as I say in, uh, before, the uh, art is the answer, and uh, art is what uh, what you can watch what you can watch on my background. It's an artwork by Andrew Friend. It's a video uh, produced by Random in two thousand fifteen. Um, as part of the program uh, investigation on the extreme land a uh, research program launched by random uh, um, uh, in 2013. Uh, we hosted Andrew Friend, I choose this video because we hosted Andrew Friend that is an English uh, artist uh, a couple of time residency in the past in our organization and uh, I think that this work is uh, really connected in some way to what we are discussing because uh, as you can see, we are the, this is the extreme point of uh, Italy on the Adriatic side. Uh, it's, this is the last uh, rocks uh, on the, um, in the Mediterranean side, uh, the connection on the, uh, between the Adriatic Sea and the Ionian Sea. And, uh, you can see sometimes Andrew, the artist, swimming into this sea, trying to cross this imaginary uh, border uh, dividing the two seas. Uh, so uh, the, the, uh, Andrew, with this simple gesture, is inviting, uh, is inviting us to reflect on the ambiguity between uh, official boundaries and perceived boundaries. Uh, the video also documents the acts of simply uh, uh, swimming in the space uh, and, um, uh, and crossing this uh, uh, imaginary or what we call, according to the International Geographic uh, Organization, is the line dividing the two seas. But for sure it's a imaginary border uh, so the, the the artist is trying to here to 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 reflect on the uh, absurdity of uh, borders sometimes and the absurdity of borders is what exactly what we are discussing here after many years of collaboration and uh, international projects in uh, creative europe mobility exchange uh, uh, the European Erasmus projects and whatever. Uh, here we are um, talking about a different situation. Uh, I will start from. Uh, I will, I will continue with my a personal uh, bio uh, and a personal uh, experience. I've been in the, the UK uh, in for the first time, not for the first time, but uh, uh, in two thousand. Uh, 13, uh, 12 and 13, I've, I collaborated with New Art Exchange in Nottingham, uh, starting to develop with the New Art Exchange uh, a program that right now is not any possible anymore. It was a, an exchange program based on the um, Erasmus program. And so it's a, it's a pro it was a program that allowed to the uh, British uh, young uh, 
I mean, young artists, creators, to travel all around Europe and to other people coming from other countries to uh, come in uh, um, in uh, UK and in Nottingham being part of this European volunteer service. Uh, this program is not uh, uh, anymore supported by European Union for UK. So, and uh, my, present, uh, my presence in the UK uh, right now, uh, I mean, uh, I could, I mean, it, it was just possible thanks to this program and developing this program. So like me, other, other young people right now could, can, uh, uh, can be in this situation of, uh, they, they cannot come in, uh, in UK for any uh, working experience uh, uh, connected to European funds or volunteer experience or traineeship or um, European uh, entrepreneurship program, all program founded by European uh, uh, Union. This is one of the important difference. So we can come in UK and people from UK can come in Italy or in other countries, but can't uh, this, uh, we have no money uh, anymore from European Union to support this kind of mobility. Uh, recently, for example, Euro uh, the European, uh, European Union launched another program after Iportonus. Uh, they launched a new program supporting cultural mobilities and this is, doesn't affect the UK. So this is important, um, an important question. But uh, let me go uh, quickly uh, on uh, a couple of other points. Uh, it seems that uh, the economic and cultural effects of Brexit is uh, often underestimated. Um, before this panel, I did some research on, uh, on the web, uh, going through some of the main uh, uh, portal art platform in Italy, uh, such Art Tribune or Exhibit Art or any other, any other or uh, platform uh, talking about art and discussing about art and uh, typing Brexit, you have no results of recent article since uh, 2021 or 2020. Uh, so it means that there is no, uh, no article, no research. Uh, so it means that there is no, or no one right now investigating the real effects of Brexit on, uh, on our sector. But uh, um, at the same time, it, it happens that the, um, the uh, art imports in UK continues to decrease, uh, bringing the UK global share of art market down of the uh, 17% last year. And uh, it was the lowest in the decade. And uh, this uh, probably would be uh, even, uh, um, it will be even uh, higher, the, the percentage. Thank of you. Yeah. Thank you, Paolo. Thank you for already doing much of the literature review that uh, some of you might want to read up on uh, in the ensuing report. That's very yeah. interesting. And we will come back to it. Excuse me for interrupting you. No worries. I did want to ask Theo in relation to your very interesting uh, point about imaginary boundaries. You have one foot in London, where you currently are, and another in Portugal, in Lisbon. And I do wonder, we, we talked a lot about um, the, the general sentiment of um, the schism uh, between the UK and the EU in the visual arts sector, but I do wonder how very physically you um, deal with it as a visual artist between these two places yourself. Um, has your practice changed? Have you changed the balance between the time that you spend in one place or the other? Do you have the same opportunities in Lisbon, um, London? Yeah, no, that balance of time is something that's constantly being negotiated. And obviously that's evolving as we speak, because I still don't feel like any of us really know quite where we're at. And there's a sense of um, kind of flailing in order to try and uh, work things out. 
Um, and obviously I'm speaking as an individual, I'm an artist. And so there's that sense of uh, being alone and trying to work things out. And yeah, what that sense of being in between two places, I guess Brexit made me feel like I'd made the wrong life decisions, um, that I'd made a mistake. And this is actually, you know, obviously I wanting to do that to enrich my life and enrich my kind of time on earth. And um, it became incredibly difficult. And I can't tell you how many migraines, headaches I've had from, obviously you listed, I'm mostly a painter and printer and sculptor. So I'm an, immersed in the physical world. And um, that's obviously one of the most difficult things to traverse with this kind of new reality of Brexit. Um, I get my paper from Somerset in England. I get my some equipment from the Netherlands, some from France. I get other bits from Portugal. Um, and so coordinating that as an individual, as an artist, is almost a full-time job. And so that general sense of what it's like to be in between two places is you, there's more unease, there's a general malaise. And I think also, obviously one of the things that for me anyway, as an artist, that's really important to me is there's, well, I've lost that informality, that general casualness, that clear vista isn't there in that same way. And to obviously coordinate all those material needs takes a hell of a lot of planning um, and obviously stress from that. Um, so yeah, I don't know where we're heading with it. Touching on what Alessio said, it feels we felt like part of this kind of progressive project. And obviously that it feels like things are gonna get kind of going backwards. Um, and obviously for many reasons, but, um, and then, so there's this kind of aspect and yeah, that's a sense of informality or chance informing your practice, etc. cetera. Um, and so, yeah, I feel like there's also, you've arrived in this kind of absurd moment where you're suddenly having to deal with what to me on a, an emotional and personal front felt like a fairly imaginary border and something that come from the past. Um, and something taken for granted. So I think I have also seen, because we did take it for granted, speaking to people in both countries, there's an appetite to suddenly get to London or the UK because it is kind of difficult and there's still things to offer there. And there's definitely an appetite from um, UK-based, London-based kind of contemporaries, friends and colleagues to get elsewhere as well. Um, never has it become more uh, apparent that we, we live on an island. Um, so, yeah, I think I, that's... I think that's a wonderful response, uh, Theodore. You talked about the materiality and uh, the imaginary quality um, and uh, the way that one underpins the other. But before we delve deeper into that, can you talk about very briefly your own physical materiality for our visually impaired um, viewers, viewers, so to speak? So I'm a white male in his 30s. I've got short, mousy, blondy, browny hair. And uh, like Johan, I'm wearing a shirt today. Thank you for that. Um, would anyone want to uh, jump in right here, Maria Luigia, Alessio, talking about uh, once, well, how how to grapple with both the very concrete, material, logistical, administrative processes on the one hand, and on the other, uh, what you so eloquently underlined the fact that. It is, first of all, the emotional, the psychological cost and, and not having completely come to terms with the new reality. Um, how, how do you navigate the two? Maybe I can say something. Uh, it, um, I think I, I think I've been finding it quite paralyzing. And, and I know I'm not the only one. I know a lot of colleagues have felt the same. It, it, it's almost like it's too big 
particularly if you're an individual or if you're a small organization, to kind of figure out how to approach this. But also there have been some, and, and Paolo hinted at this, and I think he's right, and I was saying earlier as well, you know, that there's a resourcefulness that comes uh, from working in the arts, they always find the solution. And actually, that's the whole idea of, of being creative. It's about pushing boundaries. However, uh, you know, the visa issue is already uh, a massive thing. For example, uh, since Brexit, the way we have to work with artists from Europe, from other parts of Europe, I still think Britain is in Europe, um, is is we have to kind of rethink of the budgets and present them to the border agency, the UK border agency, in a way that um, that as Theo was saying earlier, can removes any sort of casual way of like working with friends or being able to just sort of like pull resources together. There's a sort of like a that there there are these sort of stringent requirements that at one point because we were one you could easily feel um, you could just, you know, find a way around it. Now that there is this very uh, rigidly marked uh, distinction, it's not just a question of, uh, for example, one of the things that I think of as, as somebody who runs an organization is, is you know, maybe there is a way for me to just find a way around, but am I putting the artists in danger? Will that affect uh, the, you know, the way, you know, if something goes wrong and they get stopped next time they come in, will that compromise them? So I'm having to sort of then, you know, take on a, a level of bureaucracy and a level of change, a bureaucracy that also requires different funding, different ways of, you know, uh, uh, certain things you can do for a certain amount of money, that's all, if not doubled, certainly increased consider considerably. And there's also this sense of responsibility because these very complex rules that have come on board are something that you need to observe for yourself, but also for the people that you're, for the person that you're inviting, for the people, the person, whatever, if it's a group or is an individual. So it, it, this is what I find sort of paralyzing. And in the sense you know, uh, you feel like, oh, let's not even bother. It's just too big for us. And and that is extremely, extremely sad, I think. And, 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 and kind of almost, you know, does what the government wants us to do, which is to stop communicating. But we do it out of like exhaustion. Um, and, and also, uh, and sort of like a, you end up admitting defeat, even though, of course, you don't want to. And of course, uh, we, we try and do things differently. But but it, it, it it's it's an it's a big thing. It's a big thing. Absolutely. Absolutely. And in a way, the weight, the new weight of these administrative processes begs the question of how strong the desire to collaborate actually is, because. Um, British funding by the British Council, etc., concentrates more on other vistas, on Africa, on Asia, than it has even before done on the European Union. Uh, Creative Europe no longer funds uh, mobility between the UK and the EU, so new forms, new experimental forms of funding have to be found. Uh, and just, I want to jump just, in. Yeah, just just to go on that, because it, it's something that occurred to me, even when Paola was saying, you know, the fact that we can't invite people to do uh, uh, job experience, to, to do traineeship and all of that. It means that the people that are now able to travel are those that, you know, so much of the public arts in the UK and in Europe. Uh, after the Second World War was to democratize access to art, make it available to all of the people that you know were able because of their interest because of their passion they were you know they could get opportunities and that's what public funding is there to do the minute that these go the only people that can travel are those that are in a very different economic group that uh, have access to things so you're kind of uh going back to a situation where only the privileged few can have access to this mobility and everybody else is stuck within their 
locations simply because these are these opportunities that were democratizing art have now vanished and we can't you know i think it's it, we shouldn't expect the market to do it. i mean the market should do it but it's difficult to put pressure on the market to do it it should be much easier or shouldn't be like our rights to be able to put it on the governments who look at citizens but we know how governments are operating at the moment and citizenship is doesn't seem to be a um a priority or even a focus sorry um it's, it's just uh, doom and gloom there. again yeah I, I should stop talking <laughs> you I, most certainly shouldn't maria luigia uh yes no i just wanted to add something but maybe uh alessio told very well not this fact that uh, the UK for the last 10 years, uh, at least the, the the memory I have also when living there, it was this sense of democratizing uh, the, um, the access to art. And also for these, it was one of the main countries doing that, especially London. And uh, I think the impact, uh, the, the, the general sentiment we talked about is getting stronger also because of that, because... The, it was a, um, a sort of a, a center, I mean, uh, uh, of Europe in terms of culture and uh, art making. Uh, and uh, yes, we are uh, obviously this is now moving in other cities and in other capitals, but uh, uh, the, the, the impact is strong because of this. And also the desire also, I think, um, to uh, still create bridges and still, uh, I mean, try to fight these um, borders, uh, uh, and um, is because the the link that has been created in the previous years uh, through artists, through uh, art workers, and whatever is strong. It's not like um, I don't know. I imagine there are some other uh, places and. Outside, I may, I don't know. I think, I mean, anyway, this is my my thought. Yes, and Alessio told very well, I think, because I, I, I was saying there are some other little countries, no, that are outside Europe or whatever. But uh, the point is that UK was one of the main uh, cultural producer uh, in these terms of, especially contemporary art as well. No, I mean. I don't know how freeze has gone now, but uh, I mean, all the museum, all the 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 art scene uh, was in a lot of art art scene was in U in the UK. So it's difficult to face this now, you know, on, with all the consideration and all the issues we analyzed, you know. Um, I don't it know. It does indeed redraw the map, as we said, Maria Luigia. I do wonder. I mean. We cannot uh, unwind the clock, but if all four of you could magically request one thing, be it uh, easier application processes, be it administrative support, be it extra staff, where do you see the biggest obstacle in continuing um, the cultural exchange and the mobility between the UK and EU in your specific context? both individual and organizational. Who would like to take the floor first? Paolo, perhaps. Um, from my point of view, I think that the priority right now is to find a solution for the increasing uh, costs of uh, uh, transport, uh, transportation from uh, UK and uh, the, the cost for the, I mean, up to, yeah, production costs for the, for residencies uh, and uh, transportation costs for artworks produced outside UK or UK, from UK to um, bring in the Europe. The, so this is one of the priority right now, because if in a, a creative way we can avoid and find a solution, uh, to mobility issue for uh, for short term period, uh, this is impossible when we talk about um, duty and uh, uh, VAT that increased from five to ten percent and so on. So I think that we should uh, consider and we should push 
uh, politics to find a solution on uh, a better exchange uh, for professionals and uh, artworks. A very valuable point that we will take up in our policy recommendations. Thank you, Paolo. You're welcome. Theodore? Um, well, maybe it's too much of a larger ask, but um, if we're not turning the clock back, it's, yeah, it's, I guess, obviously, it's going to be touched, it's touched on by Paolo, but the absurdity of the kind of uh, dealing with that border um, and that obviously affecting flow of people, but of, yeah, of goods and artworks, et cetera. And um, I can't, I don't want to be doom or gloom either. I, I can't see a, a solution by the very nature of what a border is, it will create those problems. It's not something that can be um, quantitatively improved. It can't be quantitatively changed. It's a qualitative alteration. And, um, but yeah, it's the absurdity of that border. Um, and yeah, I, I don't know if that's too much of a big, bigger change. And I, I am asking for the clock to be turned back, but yeah. Alessia, you're, you're muted. Yeah. Hi, 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 hi. Um, uh, just taking on what uh, Theo and Paolo were saying, but also looking at the comment of Tintin Wuli, I don't know if I pronounce the name rightly, saying that um, UK was always uh, um, denied to them because um, they had its own visa. I think one of the things that uh, I've noticed and actually reading the papers in the last few days, the question of Brexit, has keeps coming up and there was a big demonstration in London um, at the weekend about sort of reversing Brexit and of course it's probably never going to be reversed but I think what we can do is continue the pressure um, because if, if we continue to stay uncomfortable with it that's the problem I think I think one of the things that I, I, I guess these governments want to do or certainly uh, those that have voted for Brexit, it's almost for it to become so normalized that we just accept it as part of life and this is what it is. And I think that this, this permanent sense of uncomfortability with it is what allows us to keep to keep pushing and to have this conversation and to go like, this is, this is not right. This does not feel good. This is not what we feel is normal. This is not progress. Um, because I think that this will perhaps, if not, reverse things which it might not happen it might start kind of creating um uh holes in it in in this in this border there might be um hernias in the border that we can exploit that we can create by keep pressing at it and that's the only thing that gives me um you know with all my doom and gloom that i've been talking about that gives me sort of some sense it's this sort of like staying with the uncomfortability and keep putting pressure and carol tongue is already putting pressure on the labor front bench and peace she says she is. yeah and i yeah. will open open up uh, the conversation in just a moment but i i did want to point out the very valuable point in the discussion saying that we mentioned several times during this conversation that there was a freedom of movement of people and cultural goods that we have taken for granted but that is a very european um, and uh, Western privilege to, to hold. This has not been granted to everyone at all point uh, in, in our times. So the fact that we are so incredibly disillusioned and disappointed now only puts us on the same level, if, if at all, with uh, the rest of humanity. Maria Luigia, would you like to come in before we open the floor? Yeah. Um, I, I have nothing to add, to be honest, and uh, in terms of, uh, I don't know, other consideration in terms of, uh, uh, I want to link also myself to the question of the, the, this, uh, uh, I don't remember the name, let me check in the chat, uh, Tintin Vula, I'm sorry if the pronunciation is wrong. That uh, and I, I think that I didn't consider it before, and uh, this um, fact of the Schengen uh, that uh, uh, um, obviously this create 
for, for example, for him, uh, the sensation of being in a Brexit situation was always like that. So um, this creates other levels of discussion and that's and these uh, general sentiments on whatever. And um, because we now feel this new, but uh, there are uh, uh, there is a, a portion of uh, um, passport holders who uh, actually never had this kind of difference on a way. And uh, another consideration I wanted to add it was about uh, uh, like before the democratization of the studies and um, about the uh, studying in the UK. Uh, I graduated in the UK and for me it was quite easy to have access in the education, uh, either because of the fee, because I was paying as a home EU, and also because uh, moving in London was easy on a way, not just take a flight and you move on a way and somehow uh, while I imagine for example if I wanted to study now uh, even for example if I imagine a PhD it would be like the process uh, uh, would be much much more difficult and uh, and so I want to think uh, maybe it's not this is the point because we are talking about mobility but uh, about the um, the future of education in the UK, no? also because some of the main university of Europe were uh, art education, some art institution, uh, art university were in UK. Uh, I think um, Royal College, St. Martin, and whatever, all these kind of goldsmiths and so on. So uh, I imagine how the, um, the future of this uh, education will be and uh, who will be the students because apart uh, the international fee is doubled so uh, i mean again who can have access to this education uh, i think also i don't have the scam in my mind exactly but if i think about erasmus for example and this is another point and uh, yes very good point, Maria Luigia. Uh, of course, the training of the next generation of artists is a very important point in, in mobility and uh, deserves further focus and attention. I would like to read out Tomoko Freeman's uh, question in the chat. Um, they ask, despite the fact of the current difficult situations, could you please share any examples if you're developing any UK Europe projects at the moment? Uh, either one of you experts, is there something that you can highlight? Well, not at the moment, but I, uh, I developed a project uh, just in the middle of uh, uh, in the passage, uh, starting from 2019 to 2021. It was a project founded by the Ministry of Culture that has a particular um, grants for international projects and international promotion of Italian art. So we had this grant in order to support the production of an artworks by Celine Condorelli, that is Italian uh, artist based in London. And uh, so the project was quite complex and uh, with different exhibition all around Europe. And for exhibition, Celine uh, did a new uh, piece of artwork. So it's kind of cumulative artworks that uh, at the end be, be, uh, become part of the uh, collection of Macro Museum in Rome. Uh, what has happened that uh, we started the project in 2019 and uh, after a while we had to face to the all what I mentioned before, basically. So it was difficult to import the artworks from uh, uh, the Tia Museum in Spain or from Italy or to move the artworks of Celine from other countries uh, to London for the exhibition at South London uh, uh, Gallery. In some uh, uh for example for some pieces it was easier to make another piece that to move the existing uh, piece so um, this is a it's a double point economic as i say i mean three point economic bureaucratic we we lost a huge amount of time going around all these questions about transportation 
costs, uh, visa issue, and uh, whatever. Um, and then it affects uh, as well the future possibility to imagine in the frame, for example, of this specific grant by the uh, Ministry of Culture, new collaboration uh, with UK organization, and in particular, uh, doing an exhibition in the UK. Uh, the only way is to produce artwork in UK and to keep that artwork in UK and then to produce new artworks in other countries. Sometimes it's easier and uh, cheaper and, uh, uh, I mean, uh, healthier <laughs> for some of us. So, yeah, this is... Possibly uh, more ecological? Of... Yeah, <laughs> probably. Well, but, I mean, it's, uh, it's a lot of work. So, uh, so it's something that we... we um, we didn't use to to face before so you, right now it's before as i say before to say okay should i should i really want to go through this or better i will choose a partner in uh, i don't know uk uh, in another country in europe or where these processes are easier sometimes it's easier i mean with other countries not only in europe but you know uh, from mediterranean side it can be easier so yeah this is this is pity and um, yeah what, about what you asked before about you know the the uh, I remember that when I was in uh, in uh, in New York, living in New York, we spent with our foreign community, we spent a huge amount of time talking about visa issue. How did you get your visa? What kind of visa you get? Who is your lawyer? How much did you pay for the, your visa? So I, I, I'm, I'm afraid that this will happen as well for people coming in the UK. Um, trying to find uh, to spend time uh, in uh, this boring conversation just in order to uh, i mean uh, be free of being uh, in, uh, in 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 country i mean it's the same that happens in uh, all the rest of the world so as you you correctly say we are privileged uh, in europe and we are talking about you know uh, people with uh, uh, many privilege, but you know, uh, it's uh, we can lose it in a, just in a while. Absolutely, Paolo. Thank you for sharing your perspective. And I think we have hit a nerve here, um, as the chat has been buzzing with comments and questions. So I would like to open the floor and ask any one of you to raise your digital hand and ask any questions or share comments with us now. I will just read out Carl Chappell's question, if that's fine, unless um, he wants to come in. Very narrow question here. And apologies if I missed this at the start, but is anyone aware of recent published guidance regarding exporting works from UK to EU, also regarding shipping work for exhibitions? which may or may not sell and therefore may or not may not be brought back. Uh, possibly Katie James from Arts Infopoint uh, UK, could you come in on that? Is that something that you can comment on? Yes, I have. I have had conversations with Carl about this previously and we've sort of helped him. Well, we try, you know, try to get some information from um, UK government, who does have some um, very initial pages on their website about working in Europe for uh, the visual, the visual arts and across different art form sectors, actually. Um, um, I think and I'm aware I'm not aware of anything specifically visual arts. I know that maybe Paula from CBAN might want to talk to this. Um, I think she's on the call here. Um, I'm certainly aware of other organisations that have um, produced some guidance about working in the EU. That's in principle, some of it may carry across to the visual arts, but some, but not in specific specificity. Um, so, um, but I think that I can see that it is something that is definitely in demand. And it's something that we will be looking at to develop as well about coming to the UK 
and we'd be you know really interested in supporting or you know um discussing this with anybody that would like to you know to look into that about outgoing mobility as well and we do link to different mobility info points where there is um where they are in you know say if an artist is going to um there is a network of mobility points across europe so if an artist is going to france for example or to germany then we can you know hook them up with the mobility info point in that country who can then hopefully give them some advice but it is a very specific area of work that i think is um needing some um some input there and we'll definitely be looking into it so yes thank you katie uh we'll i'll be thankful for, for it Kimen, Christopher, would you like to come in? Uh, hi, thank, uh, thank you. Uh, my name's Clemeni. I am a director of D6 Culture. Apologies. That's all right. I quite like it with that pronunciation. Uh, D6 Culture and Transit. We're based in Newcastle. Um, Minds of the panel, but also, I guess, people who are present, is, is the question of mobility. So, at D6, we're visual arts producers. We currently lead a Creative Europe programme alongside two British Council programmes, one in Ukraine, or rather now here, not, not in Ukraine, and one working with artists in exile in Jordan and in Istanbul. So previously, we would fund our international research through UK-based European funds for the developing markets. So we would have market development funding to do that or we would work through the iPortina schemes to share practice through international um, mobility that way. My question is, do, we've just been, we've, we have just persuaded, so I have a question at the end of this, uh, we have just persuaded one of our combined authorities to give us some support to attend some international conferences because we argue that actually to work internationally, we need to be able to still develop our practice and there is no other way of funding this now that we are not part of these European programs. So I guess my question is, is are people aware of other programs that will fund international development, not the projects even, but just the international development, development to go to a festival or to meet somebody? That was my question. Anyone among our experts or the other attendees aware of such a thing? Sorry, I didn't get the last question. Can you say again? I, I, I followed the, 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 the discourse, but I didn't get the, the, the final question. From... So my, my, my question, uh, Maria, was um, we can no longer in the UK access iPortunus. Um, Erasmus is no longer open to us. We used to have UK money from the structural funds to fund business development, which we could use. So now in the UK, there is no money for research, for, for us to travel externally for research or to invite artists here for research because the UK is no longer eligible for these European programs. So my question was, has anybody come across any other travel grants or research grants that can be used for development? Uh, you, you should go through the single country. This is the tricky yeah. point right now. So for I example, in Italy... If in Italian Italy, Council is, uh, is uh, open to the UK, no? Or... Yeah, yeah. For example, in Italy, there is a, the Italian Council supporting with very small uh, money uh, research projects or residency projects for artists and creators so uh, Italian artists can apply but it's just the Italian artists that can apply not your organization uh, from so from Europe I think that you the the, the ways to go through the single country the embassy and uh, foreign affairs like this but there is nothing specific at the moment well, that's useful thank you, Paolo. Paolo, thank you. i can see lisa kiner kiner's um, hand raised would you like to come in yes i i don't know if i put my camera on or if i stay like that i'm fine you may you. of course you may of course put your camera on thank you okay i can't okay never mind 
it doesn't work. Um, I work for Flanders Arts Institute in Belgium. We are an expertise center for the visual arts, performing arts and music sector in Flanders. And we were just granted a, a subsidy from the Flemish government, actually from Europe, but via the Flemish government that is called BAR, B-A-R, the Brexit Adjustment Reserve. So um, my question is first to a European partners organization. Have you also heard about, are you also eligible? Did you also get that kind of money? And on the UK side, um, that money is, is a adjustment reserve. So we, uh, European countries, and especially those who are most impacted by Brexit, namely, I guess, France, Belgium, the Netherlands, maybe Denmark, I mean, all those countries around the Northern Sea, um, um, give, can, 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 can apply for that money to um, go back to the, to the new normal, as they say. So re-establish contacts, um, networks, with professionals in the UK and our country. So I find this uh, very interesting and also sadly enough, it's only on one side, but um, we are planning a series of visits, professional visits with professionals from Flanders to the UK and also inviting professionals from the UK to come to Belgium for let's say like a visits program to re-establish those connections and those networks. So I was also wondering, because I, I that's also why I'm here. Um, first, I'm, I'm very uh, curious to get in touch with people in the UK um, to inform and see what we can do together. And also uh, other partners on the European side, if, if, if you heard about those bar uh, subsidies. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lisa, for um, pointing out this very interesting um, tool. And it is quite quite interesting to see that it is bilateral uh, funding uh, opportunities that seem to take uh, the place of the European Union that is no longer um, operating in this area. Sebastian Hoffmann, you shared very interesting links in the chat, and it is time for me to give you the floor. Thank you. Yeah, just commenting actually um, on the Brexit Adjustment Reserve. Um, I represent Touring Artists, the German Mobility Information Point, and uh, we also received um, EU funding via this Brexit Adjustment Reserve. And um, we'll use this money in the now and in the next years to further develop our information and consultation services on cross-border cross-border mobility between Germany and the UK. And I also shared our, the better version of the website of um, our services in the chat. Um, we call it Brexit Info Point, which is kind of like a subsection of our general services of touring artists, which are available for um, mobility from anywhere in the world to, to Germany and the other way. So just for your information that Luckily, we also received some money and we're actually cooperating with um, our partners in Flanders, Kulturloket, the mobility information point in Flanders, and of course with um, Arts Info Point UK on uh, shared content. Um, so some of the texts that we're producing will also be made available on the websites um, of our international partners. Thank you very much, Sebastian. Do we have any? Further questions, comments? No? Perhaps any last words from our experts before I give the word to Yuan to close today's webinar? May maybe. Um... Can you hear me? Yes, yes. Uh, just uh, um, just to say, uh, you know, for for many of us in the UK, we were meant to hear tomorrow, for those that are publicly funded, um, what our grant settlement for next year is. But it's been delayed because, of course, we have a prime minister that was only swore in a few hours ago. Um, and I think this is, is adding to the uncertainty that so many of 
us are feeling at the moment because we don't we know we know there's going to be funding cuts coming uh, but we don't know how much we don't know how it works um, so we've been holding our breath and we were told that tomorrow we would hear and then today we got told that it'll be delayed so I think we are in a sort of like moment of sort of you know we, we stopped in motion and uh, and I would I I don't know if I speak for for many of us, but certainly speak for for ourselves. A lot of our um, a lot of our problems. Uh, well, a lot of a lot of our ideas are put on hold, are shelved until we know what's going on. But we will be active very soon, one way or another. Uh, and I think that once we have at least a little bit of certainty locally, then uh, for so many of us, we will continue to have our interest and our focus looked at not just at our locality, but also beyond. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I also, I just want to say for the record, normally I'm a very positive, optimist person, but today it's really, it's really the wrong day. But I, I, that's not how I normally am for those of you, know, you that don't know me. But, you know, we, we, we're moving and we're ready to move. It's, uh, it's, there's, there's been a lot of setbacks, that's all. Thank you, Alessio. We'll hold our breath with you. <laughs> thank <Yuan>. you. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Alessio, and, and thank you, Veronica, for, for uh, facilitating the, the conversation. I just want to acknowledge that there is frustration because probably many of you would like to share both your personal story, uh, stories from your organization if you if you work for one, and uh, I hope there will be other opportunities also to reconvey and continue these conversation as we see they continue to evolve even at political level and hopefully for good. I mean I'm. To, to not to quote Theo, but um, in his line to say maybe we have positive perspectives at some point of re-establishing frames that allow for more, um, you know, uh, more uh, fluid uh, flows. Let's put it this way. I want to thank Alessio, I want to thank Theo, I want to thank Maria Luigia and Paolo for sharing their on stories and testimonies and points of view. Um, it has been mentioned already by uh, uh, Veronica that, um, and, and my colleague Marie that uh, a report will be published uh, later on this year on this very topic of UK EU mobility flows. And we'll make sure that not only the, the words that were uh, said today are, are reflected in this publication, but also that the desk research and all the work that is carried out by our colleagues from the mobility info points, including Katie and uh, Lisa and Sebastian, et cetera, are also contributing to building a state of the arts. Uh, and we will be uh, drafting policy recommendations for EU institutions to make sure not only um, many voices are heard in the UK, but also on the European, uh, continental European side. Um, I want also to share with you that um, these um, many information were, were shared in the chat, but we gathered a couple of resources pointing out reports like the CVAN report and many other uh, interesting readings. So we will put uh, an info sheet together that we will publish on, on the MOVE website so you can go and find links to examples, organizations, or reports that uh, were mentioned today or that really nourished the, the preparation of this conversation. And then I want to uh, thank you all for participating um, and uh, hopefully we will connect soon. Uh, don't forget to subscribe to On The Move newsletter. You know, uh, it's uh, always good to, to receive directly in your mailbox a lot of mobility opportunities and, and news from, uh, uh, you know, the international cultural field. Thank you very much.